Hi everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Before we get started, we have a couple logistics to go over with you. At the end of the webinar, there will be a question and answer session. You can submit questions at any time using the Q&A function on your screen. You can also use the chat function, which looks like a little uh, talking bubble with an ellipse in it. The chat function allows you to share questions, comments, and resources. Please let me welcome you to the third episode of the Leadership in Practice, a digital exchange webinar series which is hosted by the Midwestern Public Health Training Center. We've created these digital exchanges as an opportunity to learn about successes, challenges, and innovative approaches in applying the five themes of Public Health 3.0. By providing examples from Missouri, Iowa, Nebraska, and Kansas, we hope to impart inspiration and guidance towards achieving and advancing the mission of Public Health 3.0. Today's episode is Using a data, data Query System for Public Health Application. Our moderator is Susan Thomas. Susan is the Performance Improvement Manager at the Missouri Department of Health and Senior Services. As Performance Improvement Manager and the Accreditation Coordinator, she coordinated DHSS's FAB accreditation process, which resulted in the department's national accreditation in March of 2016. In addition to the accreditation activities, she leads and facilitates performance management, quality improvement, and strategic planning initiatives across the department. So at this time, I'll turn the program over to Susan. Thanks, Susan. Thank you. Well, we also want to uh, welcome you all to this digital exchange from a rainy, dreary day in Missouri. Um, but it's spring, so that's expected. Um, as Dr. DeSalvo said, we really do need data to tell the story of public health, and Public Health 3.0 enforces what much of us in public health already know, and that is that timely, reliable, granular, and actionable data must be made accessible to communities throughout the country. In addition to that, clear metrics to document successes in public health practice should be developed to guide, focus, and assess the impact of prevention initiatives. So during today's exchange, we have three panelists who are, will provide us with information on the challenges and, and successes of the Missouri Department of Health and Senior Services web-based data query system. You'll also hear how a small rural health department has utilized both local and state data for public health decision-making in the community. After these short presentations, we'll have time for some discussion and questions and answers. So if, as you're listening to these, you think of something, a question or need some clarification on something, please utilize the uh, chat box or the Q&A to put those um, questions in there. So let me quickly introduce the panelists before we get into it. Um, Andy Hunter is the chief of the Bureau of Healthcare and analysis and data dissemination at the Missouri Department of Health and Senior Services. Andy oversees several data sets used in the state's web-based query system for public health data. He also promotes and provides training on this suite of tools. Whitney Coffey is a research analyst at the Missouri Department of Health and Senior Services. Whitney maintains data sets relating to population, hospitalization and emergency room visits, and healthcare associated infections. Whitney also provides training on the web-based systems. And finally, we'll hear from Erica Klinger. Erica has been the administrator of the Putnam County Health Department, a county of 5,000 residents. Yes, you heard me right, 5,000 in the county, uh, for 10 years. Erica has been instrumental in diversifying her agency's grants and funding opportunities. In 2014, Erica was named the Missouri Rural Health Champion and has been featured in the NACHO Quarterly Exchange and the Missouri Livable Streets Design Guidelines. So first up, uh, Andy and Whitney are gonna talk a little bit about the Missouri Public Health Information System, which we refer affectionately to as MOFIMS. Um, and they're gonna talk about how data is gathered, how it's accessed, and how it's displayed to inform public health decision-making in Missouri. Andy? Okay, thank you, Susan. I'm going to go ahead and we've got some PowerPoint slides to help kind of show how the system works. So I'm going to transfer over to it. So um, here in Missouri, we've got um, a, developed a suite of tools, as Susan mentioned, 
to um, help the public and county health departments to better understand um, what is going on in their community. Um, the system was originally developed in the late 1990s, um, and it was uh, designed for both community health assessment as well as to provide for um, grant funding opportunities, data for grant funding, and other types of evaluations of public health programs. Um, then in the last few years, we've gotten through some grant opportunities, uh, an opportunity to enhance the system, uh, revamp it, um, kind of the two um, uh, goals of that revamp was to make the query screens more user friendly and then also more ways to uh, more and different ways to analyze to better understand um, the data sets. So what we want to do next is uh, show some of the screens. Um, if we go to, as Susan mentioned, the new system is called MoFIMS which stands for Missouri Public Health Information Management System. Um, it's a three-pronged uh, tools right now. Um, the older system was called MICA, or Missouri Information for Community Assessment. And you can see that those pr that, that acronym still lives on underneath the MoFEMS umbrella. So the data profiles on the left are more static reports. Um, if you click on those, you would get access to static reports where we've pre-identified anywhere from 15 to 30 indicators uh, for a given topic. Um, and the topics range, some of them are um, system specific, like looking at leading causes of death. Uh, others are more disease specific. So we uh, look at heart disease or diabetes and pull several different indicators from different types of data um, together in one shop or one, one location, kind of the key indicators for it. And then others are more uh, topic specific, like child health, uh, women's health, minority health. The profiles in general are, are a little easier to use, but there's not quite the flexibility that you see in the middle tool there, the data mic is. And today's presentation is going to focus on the kind of the, the data mica piece. Um, the MICAs and then the Environmental Public Health Tracking Program, or EPHT, um, those query systems are not, they, they existed in the previous system, but were um, developed using different, uh, different web applications. And so one of the goals of MoFIMS was to bring them under the same umbrella, have the same query uh, layout format uh, be similar so somebody that was comfortable accessing data with the MICAs could also easily use the EPHD data. So if a user were, were to click on the, the middle screen or the data MICAs, it would take you to uh, this page that lays out um, the various topics that we have available. And I think that that's one way that Missouri's uh, a little unique, a little bit different than a lot of states is in the, the variety of different data systems that we have. Um, I know a lot of states have query systems, but um, from my uh, review, a lot of them are limited to kind of the vital statistics in which we do have it, um, so births and deaths, but then we also have um, our hospital discharge data system. So it includes emergency room and inpatient hospital visits. Um, the Missouri Cancer Registry provides data that uh, feeds into our tools. And you can see um, on, under the chronic disease mic is that uh, the cancer incidence is uh, one of the data sets. And then under the maternal, infant, and child health mic is, we've got a series of five WIC mic is. Uh, that were developed uh, from the WIC data sets, looking at both the moms and the uh, infants and children. Um, so we do have a lot of different data sets that are feeding into it. Um, what we wanted to do next, I'm gonna turn it over to Whitney and she's gonna walk through uh, a demonstration on one of the MICA screens. So we're gonna trade out here. Sure, so we thought the easiest way to demo the system would be to ask and answer a research question like one of our local public health departments might. Um, so we were interested in the number of residents in Cole County who died of heart disease over the past five years. So hypothetically, maybe a couple years ago we got a grant and now it's time to evaluate whether or not that grant funding has potentially made an impact in our community. So we would go ahead and click on the death mica and it would take us to this home screen. So this is what um, our customizable data query screens look like. 
the top part, the choose your data portion of the screen is going to look very similar in all of the MICAs. So you can see um, up the top here, we've got things like our years, geography, and then other demographic variables, and then specific, specific causes of death available. So again, let's say that we're interested in looking at Cole County, Missouri, which is Jefferson City, where Andy and I are today, um, over the past five years, looking at heart disease mortality. So on the year, single years, I can select this drop down and choose the past five years of data, 2012 through 2016. Um, I could also use this multi-year grouping functionality you see up at the top and group years together. We know for um, death, a lot of these causes have very low counts, and so that's a good way to get you some stable rates by aggregating years together. We also have the option to choose which age group we're interested in looking at. Um, we've got a couple of different age groupings available. The basic age group has about six age groups in it. Um, but as you can see here, this expanded age groups has 21. So really granular data available here. We'll then go up and choose our geography we're interested in looking at. Again, for this example, we're gonna use Cole County here in Missouri, the central part of the state. However, we've got statewide data available, data available for some of our cities, different regions in the state, um, Burfus regions, Regional Planning Commission regions, and our LP, LPHA regions, um, as well as data down to the zip code and census tract level. So again, granularity of data is very available in this system. And then I'm gonna scroll down to this causes section here at the bottom, this big tree of all the ways that you could potentially die. And we're gonna specifically select heart disease. Once we've made those selections in the choose your data portion of the screen, we're gonna scroll down to the build your results portion. The MoFIM system has the availability to visualize data in multiple ways. So we can build a table, we can make a map, or we can create a chart using these health statistics. For this example, we're gonna go ahead and build a table to start off with. Um, on my main row, I've got my geography. So I'm gonna be comparing the Cole County rate to the Missouri rate overall. Um, on my main column, I've got year, so I can look at a trend over time. I'm gonna go ahead and look at counts and rates. For this example, we do have um, the availab availability to look at counts only or to look at some percentages here. Because we're looking at death data, I'm going to go ahead and age adjust my rates using the 2000 standard population. Um, we also have the 1970 and the 1940 standards available if you're working with more historical data. And then finally, for now, I'm not going to use confidence intervals, but this is um, a tool that we have if you want to run any kind of significance testing on your query. So with those selections made, I would submit my query. And this is the resulting data table we would see. So I'm gonna blow this up a little bit. So it looks like over time, it looks like Cole County's rates have been decreasing a little bit in the past couple of years. And it looks like Cole County's rates are overall um, smaller, lower than the state overall. Those death rates again, annualized per 100,000 residents and are age adjusted to the US 2000 standard population. But if I'm doing an evaluation and I want to prove that we've had a statistically significant impact over time, I would need to run some background tests to prove that. So in the system, one way you can do that is to add confidence intervals to your analysis. So I would simply go up, choose 95% confidence intervals, resubmit my query, and then I'd get the resulting data table. So if I look at the upper and lower confidence limits of Cole County compared to the Missouri rates, um, I can see that those limits do not overlap. And so the Cole County rate is significantly lower than the state rate overall. So that might be something important to note in my um, evaluation for this grant. We also have the ability to create charts using the MoFIMS tool. There are four different charts available. We can do vertical bar charts, horizontal bar charts, trend lines, and pie charts using this data. And then you can see there's a bunch of ways you can customize how you want your chart to look. I'm gonna go ahead and select trend line here so we can look at some of this mortality data over time. 
So when I do that for Cole County, you can see my yellow line here is my heart disease deaths. I've also added cancer, stroke, and CLRD for some comparison here. Um, and you can see over time somewhat of a fluctuation in the rates, but over the last couple of years, again, declining. We also have the availability to map this data. So we've switched up our data sets here a little bit and we're looking at injury now. We've gone ahead and created some maps and then exported them to our side-by-side -side tool so we can look at them on the same screen. These are significance maps, whether or not rates are significantly higher, lower, or not significantly different than the state overall. On the left, we're looking at motor vehicle accidents. On the right, we're looking at firearm injuries. And so when I put these two charts side by side, it's really easy for me to see, knowing Missouri, that in the more rural areas of the state, I see the um, darker orange counties, the significantly high counties for motor vehicle accidents, again on the left. However, if I look at the map on the right, I can see my counties with significantly high rates for firearm injuries are my more urban areas of the state, so St. Louis, Kansas City. So that might be really important as I'm going through and doing program planning and resource allocation. You'll also notice on the graph to the right um, that some of those counties have crosshatching on them. We do that to, to signify that the counties have less than 20 events occurring during the designated time period for the designated cause. Um, it just lets us know that the relates are, rates are unreliable or unstable and so kind of proceed with caution um, when comparing those rates. And so that's a very brief overview of some of the things that you can do with our system. With that, I think we're gonna turn things over to Erica and she's gonna talk about how her health department has used some of these resources. Sure. Let me real quick, thank you, uh, Andy and Whitney for um, going over that. You can kind of see how the how capable the system is and, and the kinds of things that are available through the system. But I think that it usually, having seen all that, the, the big question is, okay, how do we utilize that in an everyday situation? And that's what um, Erica is going to be able to give us some kind of some real life examples of how she's been able to use not only that data, but some other local data um, to help her make some decisions in the county where she lives. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Susan and Andy and Whitney. Um, I thought I would give you a little bit more demographically about our county. As Susan mentioned, it is uh, just shy of 5,000 residents. Um, it's an extremely rural county. We're very far north on the Iowa border. Um, we do just have one school district that's K-12 that services the entire county, and it's located right here in our county seat where our health department is as well. Uh, we have one critical access hospital, and just for point of reference in terms of staff at the health department, we have just five full-time staff. Um, we do have some part-timers, but they're pretty ex extremely part-time and a couple of contracted staff. So I have been here for just over 10 years, and one of my first charges as the administrator when I took over was to complete a community health assessment. And so... Um, I really just poured myself into that when I got started and used the MICA um, and built a 25 page um, assessment was the end result of local data um, with, with the MICA being my go-to for data. So um, we've kept that document updated on a pretty consistent basis. We do use interns from Truman who come each summer to assist us with the update. Um, but most importantly, that community assessment really served as a starting point for multiple um, successful grant app applications in our county. Um, within just a few months of completion, we did use that as a starting point to apply for a competitive contract from DHSS from the state, which was the Chronic Disease Primary Prevention. And we were one of the few awarded statewide. And we were able to pull that information out of our assessment and make that case um, for the need. And then we built on top of that with then with funding from NACHO, which was the Achieve Grant, and then for um, also from Missouri Foundation for Health, um, which is a foundation that only services about 84 counties in um, Missouri. And so 
each time we were using data that was compiled from our assessment. Um, we've also used our assessment by sharing that with community partners. Um, recently, our hospital within the last few months contacted wanting um, to the most recent version of that, and they used that as a starting point where they identified topics for articles that they wanted to put in our local paper. Um, I've also steered community partners toward the actual resource, not just what's in the assessment, but toward the MICA with, and now MOFIMS, um, where they could pull down their own data. Again, the hospital was um, writing a grant application for a digital mammography machine, and they were able to pull cancer rates um, and utilize and incorporate that into their um, funding request. Uh, in another instance, we had the elementary principal contacted me and was concerned because she felt like she wasn't having a good turnout for her um, preschool and kindergarten screenings. And so we were able to go to the birth mica and pull data from um, that to see if she, you know, actually how many eligible students there were within a time frame. Um, so that's some practical ways that we've been able to, you know, go to the resource as well. Um, but most, rec most recently, we did use the MOFIMS as we completed a very focused maternal and child health assessment. Um, we're in a planning phase right now, which is a year that we have to develop, um, do the assessment and then develop a plan. And um, so, so we were able to use the MOFIMS for data for that as well. And all told, um, in our experience, this resource has really just been an invaluable tool in painting a picture of our community uh, for utilization of data, especially in pursuit of funding. Great. Well, that gives us, I think, a couple of real life examples, like you said, of how the data was be able to be used to make some public health decisions, not only for you at the health department, but it sounds like also for the school system and the hospital too. And um, just, uh, Andy, real quick, um, as far as getting access to the system, it, we heard the local health department has access, the hospital does. Um, what's the uh, process, I guess, for access? Does anybody have access or is there a certain procedure? Sure. Um, the system is designed um, so anyone can access it. Um, there are some, some of the newer features that are only available for registered access. Um, so we've got really three different layers at this point. The general public, so anyone, that's what we call level one. Then level two, um, you can, anyone can sign up for an account and get um, a little bit more granular data and a few more, uh, and, and it's all free. The, the register level two is, is free, um, but you can get access to a few more, um, kind of the, a little bit more granular data and then also, um, a few more of the, the enhanced features. Then we do have a third level where it's available for county health departments and our internal staff where the suppression has been turned off and so they can see the really small numbers, but it's also marked so that they know that if they were in one of the lower levels, then that number would be suppressed. Okay, and the uh, access to the public is on our website, correct? That's right, yeah, it's uh, the www.health.mo.gov, and then the link there in the upper right-hand corner, there's a data and statistics tab. If you click on that, then that takes you to a page that has the MOFIMS and the, the, the MICAs. Great. So um, I'll kind of get us started with a couple discussion questions, but I did want to encourage everyone to, if you have a question that for Erica or Andy or Whitney, go ahead and put that in the chat box or in the Q&A and we'll go back and forth between some of the discussion questions and thoughts that I had and what you all might have interest in. Um, so there's always a lot of discussion around public health. Um, it, you know, it's hard for us to tell our story because the, of the lag time in getting data and uh, some of the decisions we have to make uh, are on emerging issues and some of them come up kind of quick. So I wonder, Andy, could you speak to maybe some of the barriers or the successes in getting more timely data? Sure, um, I, that's certainly one of the critiques or criticisms of the current system is that um, 
you know, it's, um, it's a little bit faster than it used to be, but it's still, there's a little bit of lag time for us to get kind of the final file. Um, and it's like each data set kind of has their own time schedule for when it, when it will go final. So it's not like all the data is going to get updated at a certain point in time. Uh, usually our vital statistics, um, gets finalized sometime about in the spring to early summer and then with a little bit of time to develop the data sets uh, and obtain the right population estimates from Census Bureau. Um, generally it gets updated in the fall uh, like so when the 2017 data would be updated sometime in the fall of 2018. Um, the hospital data it's a little it's a longer lag because we have to get some out-of-state records so it's usually six or nine months behind um, the, the vital statistics, um, and then our cancer registry is the slowest data set to, to, to come in. Um, so we do try to work with the county health departments uh, if we can sometimes on trying to provide provisional, more provisional type data. Vital statistics in particular produces more of a PDF style report giving uh, monthly birth and death counts at the state level but I realize at the local level, sometimes getting state trends isn't, isn't enough. Um, and there also the department collects some other data uh, on the hospital side. The Essence program gets much more real-time data um, and analyzes, runs reports on it. Um, so that's another potential data source that's not directly funneling into the MICAs, but another data source that would be available. Um, it's not a perfect system, but it's it's kind of the best that we've got at the moment. And you heard you said the more real time data um, people can access some of that by calling the department, I guess, and requesting it through um, the the program area that provides that. Right. Um, Erica, as far as timely data from your uh, from your impact, has it? Has it impacted your county at all as far as data that's late or anything like that or things that you needed right away that you just couldn't get? Sure. I mean, we've, we've definitely had experiences where we knew that the data that we were accessing wasn't maybe a true picture of our current reality. Um, I can think of an example just from this past fall where we had, uh, when we were doing our MCH, our maternal and child health assessment, and we knew that the unintentional injury rate that we were looking at probably, um, you know, that it wasn't going to reflect, um, we had two child fatalities over the summer, and that is a lot in a small county that we knew would spike our rate and that wasn't being reflected yet. Um, another instance or a research point that comes to mind is looking up the insurance rates for our county. Um, in the county level study, that's something that's reported out on the um, community data profiles and that data is from 2011. And so I've just looked elsewhere to get more current rates um, on, on that specific thing. And then, you know, in some instances, we've just done the best um, with what we have, you know, um, but when we, we have taken it a step further if something isn't adding up. And I can give an example of that in our um, MCH assessment as well. Um, we had some data from Kids Count in 2017, which were rates that were showing from 11 and 15, but um, specific to substantiated um, child abuse and neglect. And we knew through our qualitative research, through our stakeholder interviews that we conducted that um, what we were hearing wasn't necessarily matching up. So in that case, we did go ahead and call the local um, children's division circuit manager and just drilled down and got the numbers um, for our county from them. She was able to provide us the number of hotline calls that were made in a year. And she went back four years for us so that we could look at an average. Um, and then she also was able to tell us the number of at current out of home placements in our county, um, children who were living with someone, you know, other than mom and dad. Um, and then we also were able to request information from the school. Um, we asked them to give us the total number of students who lived with someone other than mom and dad. And then um, they even took it a step further and compiled some additional at-risk factors because we, I think, you know, some of the questions that we were asking spiked their interest as well. I think what you bring up is a good point in that um, a lot of times there's some local data 
that may be more accessible and more timely that would help you make some decisions at the local level rather than always relying on something that the state provides. Right. Um, the example that I just gave being the most recent where we did gather that data from our community partners and ultimately we ended up choosing child abuse and neglect as our priority, our priority health issue that we're going to focus on for the next three years. Um, and for that MCH assessment, some other local data that we collected um, with the assistance of Truman State University, which is about 45 minutes from us in Kirksville, um, they did a community-wide assessment and they actually did it for the region, but um, per county, on a county basis, um, they rolled up the results. And so they were able to break out what the community felt the priority issues were for the maternal um, and the maternal and child um, population, which again, reinforced our child abuse and neglect. Um, we did that through an electronic survey, but we could also do hard copy where then they rolled them up um, into their Qualtrics system. So um, we also have used Truman for other things as well. They um, conducted a telephone survey for us on a separate grant that we had with, uh, that where they, we wanted to look at some chronic disease indicators. And so um, some things specific to tobacco use and facilities for exercise in our county. And so, um, we just wanted, you know, a larger sample than maybe what you get through Berthus and then a, a tab those county specific questions. So um, we were able to utilize their assistance for that. Um, some other local data sources that we used include, of course, tracking our surveillance data that we collect from um, our community partners like the school nurse, daycares, the clinics, um, the nursing home, the hospital and so forth to look for trends over time. Um, and then we've gathered information from our community partners too, such as the food bank, the farmer's market, or the backpack buddy. We have a backpack buddies program um, through the school. So um, some other tools that we've utilized, of course, the census data with the American Community Survey and the county health rankings. And then just last week, the Missouri Foundation for Health actually um, released Explore Mo Health, and that is, has um, zip code level data for our state. Great. That's a lot of good, good other data sources there. Andy, have you heard of any other locals that have utilized anything different than that? I just thought I'd give you an opportunity. Um, nothing else that comes directly to mind. I don't know, Whitney, if you have any other, think of anything else. Not off the top of my head. I mean, we hear about innovative strategies and maybe going out to other more national data sets fairly frequently. Um, but I think those community data sets are things that they're using ad hoc and we don't necessarily hear about them all the time. I know one of the counties in the Kansas City area had uh, approached us. They were trying to collect clinic level data um, for um, childhood obesity program and we're going clinics and getting data also from the YMCA um, and we're asking our advice on kind of once they had all that data collected how could they best analyze it um, and so we had a, some conversations about the limitations obviously it's a subset of the all all records and so you'd have to be pretty careful about um, you know, making overarching conclusions about the overall population based on kind of those two subgroups. And they didn't yet have the data, they were just in communication about collecting it. It sounded like it was gonna go forward, but they didn't yet have the data in, in hand, so it was a little hard to know kind of what the results from that were gonna be. But that's one of the examples that comes to mind of, of, of record level data at the community. Right. Well, I would encourage anybody else who's out there uh, listening, if you have some data source that you've used, feel free to put it in the uh, chat box and uh, I can share it or everybody else can see that as well. Um, we did have one person uh, come in and ask a question, Andy, about is there a place on the MoFEMS homepage that shows where to click to find sign up instructions? So once they go to the web page, how would they know how to sign up? Um, I just saw that question come in and I tried to respond to it. Okay. I don't know if everybody will 
can, we'll be able to see that or not. Um, I also could go back to the share screen and uh, show you on the web page. I sent the link. Um, let me try this. And I'm going to have to go back. Let me see. Here we go. Um, down here in the bottom left hand corner of this page, um, there's a click here for sign up and login instructions. Um, and then there's also another link for our health data training classes. Um, so that's really where they would go to um, for those two topics. Okay. And I sent in the Q&A the, the web link to this, this page. Thank you. Um, let's see, another question has come through. Um, do you have ways that you can track who uses MICA? Is it primarily public health departments, people at universities, um, uh, just in general, what types of users do you have? So that's a good question too. Um, we do get um, able to track web hits, so that doesn't necessarily tell us where they're coming from or who's using it, but we can get like in an aggregate sense how many people are using the system. Um, with the new um, kind of um, registration process, we know who's requesting logging in uh, for the level two um, and level three access. and. Uh, the level three in particular, I have to sign off on them getting access to it. So confirm that they work for a, a county health department and should be accessing the unsuppressed data. Um, you know, we also have, um, you know, get phone calls and emails that come in. Um, and we have a data request tracking system that so we kind of monitor who our users are that way. Um, we also have a user distribution list. Um, and we have a we call it a quarterly newsletter. I don't think we really average um, four in a calendar year, but we send out, I would say, somewhere between two and four newsletters in a year and have amassed a, a, a very large distribution list from conferences and training classes uh, over the years um, so that that goes out too. I mean, anecdotally, I feel like the county health departments are still the number one user of the system, kind of our number one target audience but we do get a lot of people from universities, um, from hospitals, um, sometimes uh, some more elementary and high school school nurses have, um, have uh, inquired, had questions. Um, nonprofit yeah. groups. Yes, and Whitney's right, the others, the nonprofit groups um, often attend the training classes. So Andy, if somebody doesn't get the newsletter and would like to, is it possible for them to get on the list? For sure, we can, um, we'll put in, um, in the chat window, our email addresses. And if they want to uh, register for that newsletter, um, just um, contact uh, Whitney or I and we'll get you included in our, uh, in our distribution list. Spoiler alert, I think we'll have a newsletter coming out towards the end of this week or early next week. So. <laughs> Good timing. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so let me go back to uh, one of the other questions or discussion items that I had. Um, Public Health 3.0 talks a lot about workforce and the importance of our workforce being prepared for public health and having the information they need. Um, sometimes, myself included, data is not a strong point of someone who comes into the public health system. So um, how First, let me start with um, you, Erica. In what ways have you been successful or have you found in helping your staff become comfortable with data if they come in just thinking to themselves or telling you, you know, man, I do not, I'm not good with data, <laughs> but you need some specific data. So how have you kind of helped uh, transition that? Sure. So Andy mentioned that they offer trainings. And I myself, as well as uh, my staff, I've had my staff attend the trainings as well, um, because the MICA, MOFIM really is our, is our first line of data. So um, we've, we've had staff attend that. And then I, I really feel like just getting into the system and creating queries and practicing um, trial and error has been as helpful as anything. But having that base through the training that's offered 
um, is certainly helpful. Has there been any other trainings that, you, that you've utilized other than the DHSS training specific to MICA? I mean, is there anything from the university or um, not really? No, no, no. I mean, we've had specialized evaluation for different grants that we've held um, where we've hired an evaluator who's assisted with the data piece, mm -hmm. um, you know, from an evaluation standpoint, like in one instance, we did a um, so park evaluation where we looked at activity levels in um, the park before and after renovations, but um, yeah, on a broader scope, nothing else comes to mind. Okay. Um, and Whitney, you guys mentioned not only your trainings, but you do do some one-on-one -on -one technical assistance if people are having some problems or need some additional information or just need data and don't have any idea where to, how to get it. Sure, definitely. So just a little bit of follow-up on the trainings. Those are free two and three day trainings that we travel to several sites um, across the state to do. Um, we try to make them accessible for everybody. Um, but if you're not able to come to one of our trainings, we're always available through email and then giving us a call. If you get into the system and you have questions or are confused or if you're looking for alternative data sources. Um, Andy and I work in the data dissemination unit, so that's always something we enjoy doing is talking to people who are using this data and looking for other data sources to positively impact their work. It's that's where we nerd out a little bit and we really <laughs> enjoy helping with those questions. <laughs> yeah, we love you guys nerding out. That means we don't have to, so. Um, let's see, I don't see any more questions yet. So let me go to, don't forget to type them in there. We're happy to answer those. Um, another important part of 3.0 that really weaves itself through all of the different areas is how important leadership is to um, progressing to Public Health 3.0. So I just wanted to, uh, Andy, if I could start with you maybe, and how have leaders been kind of a driving force behind making sure that DHSS data is available? So I think we've had, we're lucky that we've had a strong support for really, you know, 20 years or more um, at the department level and trying to, providing the resources to get this data out. Um, certainly, back in the late 90s, Missouri was at the forefront of, um, you know, developing a web query system that the public could access. It cut down on our uh, data requests, I know, at that time pretty dramatically. And then I think more recently, uh, with the, the advance to the MoFIM system, you know, that's continued. Uh, the, whole, the whole process of working with IT contractors to develop the tools um, that we've got now um, took a little bit longer than what was originally anticipated. I think that's kind of the norm with most big projects, you know, always takes a little longer than you hope. Um, but in the end result, um, you know, you wonder about it as we're working through it, but at the end it was definitely worth it. And that wouldn't have been possible without strong support from our uh, division and department leadership, uh, providing the financial resources and the time to allow us to to, to get it built and build something that we could be proud of. Right, that's important to note. It's not just um, uh, the money necessarily, but it's also the time commitment that it takes to do that. Right, yeah, because we have several analysts that, um, you know, you get developed test sites, but then you've got to make sure that the data is accurate and presented in a way that you're comfortable with, <laughs> and it just, all that takes time. Mm -hmm. Um, Eric, anything from your perspective, you kind of as the leader of the health department, but other leaders maybe in the community that have kind of supported the data functions and the data capabilities of the, the health department? Um, you know, I just, from, from a twofold perspective, I guess, yes, uh, definitely people turn to us for data, um, which then we turn around and rely on the state. So we too are appreciative of, um, of their support of the system. And I guess, you know, having attended the NHO conference a few years back, um, you just don't, I didn't realize how fortunate that we were in the amount of local data that we had um, until you start hearing what other states have or lack. And so I am appreciative of that because, um, 
because we're pretty lucky that way. So, okay. Um, let's see. I have one more question here. So, um, sometimes geographically large or dense communities need more granular data to target some specific interventions. And um, some, and I, I guess there's data issues related to both dense communities as well as rural communities when it comes to maybe having enough data or uh, specific enough data to assure confidentiality. Um, so Andy, maybe I can start with you and say, what are some challenges and successes of providing data at a more granular level across the state? Okay, sure. So the way I see it, there's kind of two challenges when you get start talking about low numbers and granular data. Um, first is, as you referenced, the potential for um, personally identifying information getting released, and that's something we take very seriously. Um, you know, it's very important to us that that does not happen, that we, um, you know, are good stewards of the data. So we've taken steps to suppress uh, low numbers um, to avoid avoid that. I also think kind of a, a related issue is uh, trying to base um, decisions on unreliable rates. So it's not necessarily that we're afraid that you're going to be able to personally identify individuals with the data, but you might draw un faulty conclusions based on really small numbers. Um, and so kind of both of those play into how we developed our query tools. Um, we have though with the new MoFIM system um, provided some more granular type data. We've always had zip code level data available for analysis, but with MoFIMs we also have added the uh, census tract for um, the level two and above. So the general public can still access it, although the suppression levels are still turned on. So if it's uh, below a certain threshold, generally it's five, then it'll be um, suppressed. Um, the other challenge that we've had is just um, in generating rates. Um, the Census Bureau provides us with annual files for um, county level, so it's a pretty straightforward process in calculating rates for counties on a year-by-year -year basis, but for census tract and zip code, um, they don't the American Community Survey developed some estimates based on five-year trends, but we're not completely comfortable with um, some of those estimates, the, the volatility of them. There's some pretty high variance, air variance with them. And so at this point, we haven't tried to incorporate those into the, to, count, to generate rates on the tools. Right now, it's counts only. The other tricky part about the census tract in particular is that the geographies change every 10 years. And so the number, you know, the numbering system that uh, is used, say, for the 2010 census that we're currently in, when the 2020 census rolls out, it's going to change. So, um, so that's another consideration to, that just makes it a little bit tricky. Um, but we do recognize that places like, um, you know, Ericus County, um, Putnam with 5,000, um, and then we have other counties like St. Louis County that has over a million people in the county. So obviously in places like St. Louis, um, there's a lot of variety inside the county. And so hopefully getting access to the zip code and census tract level data will help be able to tease out some of those differences across, across the county that have a million people in it. Um, Erica, from your perspective as a rural county, have you, what kind of challenges maybe have you faced with getting, being able to, I guess, make decisions um, with the data? Well, we've definitely had instances where the sample size is not large enough for a stable rate in our county. Um, but to mitigate this, we've tried to do things like looking at regional rates or even um, combining our data with some bordering counties for dual or tri-county rates, especially when we've partnered with those neighboring counties for funding applications and had success that way. Okay. That's a really good point. I think we encourage people to either combine counties or combine years to try to get the numbers up. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, well, let's see. I don't see any questions from anybody yet. Am I missing? You guys see any out there that I'm missing? Either we've done a really good job of telling you everything you needed to know or um, Is there any, uh, let me just give you guys both, Erica and Andy, a uh, final chance to kind of conclude things or uh, provide any information that you thought maybe we didn't cover in the, the um, exchange so far. I would just say that um, I know engaging in a community health assessment can be a daunting task um, and overwhelming, but that if um, that it's worth it, that the time that you put into compiling that and, um, and not just the data that we get at the county level from the state, but, you know, the quality of data too from your community partners that in the end, having a picture of the needs in your community and being able to, um, you know, pursue funding to go after um, the funding that you need to make a difference in your community, that it's really worth it. So. Um, it was just by chance that that was a deliverable that was due for our then core contract with the state the year that I started, but it was really, uh, I, I lucked out in a sense, so. Yeah. Andy, any final thoughts from your perspective? Um, we're just gave um, some of our contact information in the chat window, and then I think Whitney's also gonna, we've also got like our user distribution list. Um, email address. So if anyone wants to join, um, they would certainly be welcome. Contact us or contact that uh, MoFIMS user group email address and we'll get you added. Okay. All right. And it looks like maybe there was one other question that had come in late. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> All right, Kate. All right, well, special thanks to our panelists and our moderator and to all of you for joining us today. In a few days, you'll receive an email with links to the archive webinar, which will be posted on our website, www.mptch.org. Also including the email will be an evaluation for the webinar. We ask that you just take one to two minutes to fill out the survey because it will use that feedback to help enhance our future webinars. Please join us next week on Tuesday, April 3rd at 12 p.m. Central for our final episode of our series entitled Foundational Infrastructure, a Focus on the Public Health Brand. Thanks again for joining and have a great afternoon.